welcome to the second talk of the student part. Um, now we, we are going to have one of the, I think one of the biggest implementations that uh, we have ever seen uh, for a huge bank in Mexico and all the learnings that we got from that big implementation uh, from the end of the team of Infotech. Welcome. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, like Javier just said, we're going to talk about Open Banking Core for the Mexican government. So I'm Federico Gonzalez. I'm the CEO of the National Research and Innovation Center for Technology of the country. So I know it's very weird that you have a politician or a public service member here in the in, in the presentations. I know that every time I go to a open software forum, they go, really, Mexico is doing stuff in open source, so it's very bizarre. I'm here also with Victor. He's our solution architect for, for the solution, especially in the, in the banking core. So I'm actually going to change a little bit, I think, the, the rhythm of the track. Because I'm not only going to, we're not only going to be talking about the product and what we've done with MyFos and Fenerac, but I'm also going to present to you a little bit about what actually Infotech is. So that's kind of like our short name for the agency. I will also touch base in what Mexican government is doing to promote a little bit of open source, um, because I know that's kind of like one of the topics, and we saw it today in the morning. Then we'll talk about why we actually built this open banking core, and then Victor will get into some of the technical features and show you a little bit bits and pieces of the product that we've actually built up for you. So what's Infotech? The million dollar question, I got there about three and a half years ago. It was very hard to define, but we came up with this beautiful phrase that we're a public research center of the federal government, which contributes to the digital transformation of Mexico. We do this through research, innovation, academic training, and development of information and communication technologies products. This we can sell to private and public sector, and we want to try to enable pathways that lead to a modern Mexico and a digital inclusive one. So pretty much we've got um, a whole lot of range of things that we do. So you can see that it's a very broad spectrum. So we do have a software fabric, so that's where we're doing some software development. Then we've got a division where we're doing specialized products, and this is where this banking system that we've baptized as CB, which is pretty much integral banking infotech system. And quickly translated that. And, um, and then we've got data center and IT infrastructure. We actually have the largest government owned data center in the Mexican government. Then we also do our research and development team. So we do have teams that are working constantly in R and D, but they're also doing academic stuff. So during the pandemic, we actually did the mobile, the, the index of mobility in the country. So were people actually going out? Were they moving? And this was used to actually take decisions on how the government was reacting to the pandemic. And then we also have academic programs. So Infotech on numbers, so you can get a little bit of a dimension of how big um, Infotech is. Mexico being a big country, everything is massive. We are around 1,500, 1,800 people working currently in Infotech. And this is between researchers, developers, um, data center crew, administration, um, people on site working in different projects. We have seven master degrees. So one of the most popular ones right now um, is um, a master in digital law. So that fusion between technology and the legal world, which nowadays you don't really have any cases that you don't have digital media that are part of the evidence. So how are we dealing with that, intellectual property, that kind of things. We've got the research projects that I just mentioned you one from the pandemic. We have a tier three certified data center, which is the largest one in the country, like I mentioned before. And then we have a secondary DRP data center in Mexico City to three locations, Mexico City, the city of Aguascalientes, and city of Pachuca. We are a certified institution from ESO, the CMMI Institute. 
Um, we have the actual, we have four labs. One of them is the National Lab of Internet of the Future for the country. So that's a lab that services a whole country. And we also have kind of like a big data lab. We also have a national monitoring center for SOC and NOC operations. So pretty much everything that lives within our data center gets monitored there, but also we monitor some of the external entities within the government as well. And we're just about to launch, hopefully before the end of the year, we're gonna be launching the Infotech Open Community. So this is gonna be a community where the development that Infotech has done over the years can become a public good. And any government agency, federal, state, or local can access these codes. The logic behind this is we've spent money, we've spent resources, we've spent time building this technology. Now we want this technology to be used by everybody that's, that's able to get access it. So instead of having government spend the same amount of money on the same product, they can benefit from whatever we've done. Of course, it won't be everything that we've got because some of the stuff we need to keep it either confidential or, 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 um, or we need to keep the property to be able to subsidize. An interesting thing about Infotech is that we do all this without receiving a dime from government budget. We're a 100% self-funded organization. So we're really more of a private, we're more like a company so we need to go and we need to sell business to generate revenue. Once we get that revenue, then we can do the R&D, we can do the academic side. So we're a self-supported agency. Some of the projects that we've worked with in the last couple of years, we've got the Ministry of Health. Um, so we actually built the distribution system for medical products that's like currently operating in the country. We did the COVID-19 mobility index that I spoke about earlier. We hosted the COVID-19 vaccination app for the entire country. We did in foreign affairs, the platform that is being used to issue passports abroad is part of the Infotech um, technology that we've developed in our services um, with the foreign agency. And this passport is now the electronic passport of Mexico. So that was also a very big revolution that we, that we were able to do there. We're also working on a project called CFE Internet for All. This is pretty much an attempt for the Mexi from the Mexican government to try to reach the places where there's no connectivity in Mexico. So we're helping them build um, the backbone of fiber optics. So we've lit more than 10,000 kilometers. Um, we've, we've helped to install more than 2,000 BTS antennas around the country. And we have more than 100,000 open Wi-Fi hotspots that we have distributed and we're currently supervising the operation of these. We're also working with the Ministry of Health Authority. So this is kind of like the one that authorizes medicines and some equipment. So we are doing the online service platform. We built that from nothing and that's now operating. The Water Commission of Querétaro. Querétaro is one of the larger cities in Mexico. It's one of the fastest growing in the country. And there we're employing, we're, we're administering part of the operation of the water system. And we've also just launched their payroll system for more than 2,500 employees. Ministry of Labor, we've done an employment portal, youth development platform that's currently operating. And finally, I think one of the ones that I'm most proud of, we're actually contributing to El Salvador. And we've helped them launch their School of Innovation and Technology. And they're actually operating four technic higher technical education programs that began at Infotech. Um, these programs, I will talk about them a little bit more because one of them you're probably going to be quite surprised has to do with a lot of stuff that we're talking here today. We have built strategic collaborations as, a, as an agency. We were able to, to, to discover a way that we could create um, and grow our technical and scientific capacities. And we were able to sign agreements with all of these um, actors to do that with. And of course, we, we decided to put MIFOS on top, of the, on top of the list because it's the talk of today. But we also got Red Hat, Amazon, Huawei, Google, Akamai, Microsoft, CentOS is a local cybersecurity um, company, Xfusion, the lead technology. So there's a lot of work behind this. It's been quite a, quite a wild ride for the last three and a half years, but we're now working with some really interesting people. When it comes to the academic programs, I mentioned earlier the, the one in in law, 
but we also got master in strategic di direction of ICT, economic regulations, and competitivity of the telecommunications sector. So that's actually a tailored made program for the Telecommunications Agency of Mexico. And we also got a doctorate in data science. So if any of you speak Spanish and want to study with us, you're more than welcome to, to do so. Taking on to the higher technical um, programs, this has been an effort at the end of the day, if we want to revolutionize and we want to create a digital transformation in Mexico, we need to build talent. Um, unfortunately, everywhere in the world, there's a scarcity of talent right now. Mexico is no exception. So we've actually built these programs to be semi-practical. Um, so they're going to be taught kind of like a basis. And then the hope is that we can incorporate them into the operations of several public research centers around the country or government agencies. Um, we focused on four programs. So one of them is in open software development because nobody teaches you open source development as a actual degree. Everything has to be matched to something. Then we've got the data center operations. Data centers are growing a lot in Mexico. There's going to be a big presence. Pretty much all the big companies are building data centers at the moment. So we need to have people that are going to be ready to operate those, those um, within those companies. Um, cloud services. We also discovered that a lot of the cloud teachings in universities and schools, they were matched to a company. So whoever had donated the lab or whoever was giving them credits to work on the cloud, those was a, that was a technology that kids were learning these days. So we wanted to break the mold and go with something that was neutral so they actually have a basis of how cloud computing operates and takes them forward. And of course, we couldn't leave out cybersecurity. We've spoken about it several times today. Um, it has to be one of the priorities, I think, along the way. So that's a little bit about InfoTech. Now you're probably thinking, what's Mexico doing with all of that? And why are we here? The digital transformation has been on the agenda for a while, um, but it, was, it, it didn't really hit it off until this uh, current administration, which has been going for about five years. During this administration, there has been very much a sense of having techn technological sovereignty generating technological capacity. So everything used to be subsidized and third partied out. So we're actually trying to build capacities. And right now we've got kind of like four big agents within the transfer, digital transformation of Mexico. Pretty much our, our head comes from the National Digital Strategy Office who reports directly to the president. So they've been kind of like promoting independence, digital sovereignty, using the transformation agenda, basically transforming with the use of technology to enhance and make the government more open, more efficient, increasing the internet um, capacities in Mexico. That has been one of the priorities to actually get the territory connected because we cannot talk about democratizing information if you haven't got access to that information. And there's still a lot of the country that, that didn't have access to, to these communications because the private companies didn't see it as, a, as something that was profitable. So if it's not going to generate us money, why should we make it? And, the four, and, and one of the agendas has also been to promote the use of open source for this. Then we go to the National Council of Humanities, Science and Technologies. And I want to put a bit of an emphasis in humanities as this has just recently been incorporated into the name of this agency, because humanities and technology need to be together. At the end of the day, the end purpose of technology normally ends up with a human. And a lot of the time, we don't think about how, what human interactions are going to be like or what the human impact is going to be in regards to the science and technology. So they want to promote the, the training, the research, the dissemination of this knowledge, developing cutting edge um, technology with our own national capacities, promoting universal access to humanistic and scientific knowledge. So this is where I think when we're talking about doing this open community, it also helps. Prevention um, and attention to national issues and coordinating the 26 research centers that are currently in the country. Then after that, we've got the CEFE Interempartos, which is kind of like a branch of the National Electricity company, which are focusing 100% on internet connection for the country. So pretty much 
big side of it is pretty much getting connected. They have growing uh, mobile networks, so now you've actually got mobile services given by this government agency. Of course, the price and accessibility to this is a lot cheaper than a private sector one. And Infotech has the amazing job of having to support these three pillars of the transformation and become the fourth one, because a lot of what they're requesting and what they're handing in their legislation and their regulation, we are ex actually executing it. So we've become a very important partner of the digital transformation in Mexico. It is a bit of a big bargain and a lot to do, but it's really fun and the projects are amazing. So now you're probably gonna think, okay, so we heard this morning that the, the EU is going against the use of open software. We've actually regulated completely opposite. And this is one of the examples that I have to show you. And this is actually an agreement that came out in 2021. And this is actually Article 61. This agreement comes out from the National Strategy Office, um, issued kind of like the guidelines of how technology needs to be operated within the country. And it's pretty much straight away, it says, no, institutions may implement general purpose computer applications from public repositories of open source software. Whoa. Agencies can actually take open software and deploy it. Provided they have the characteristics required for the exercise of public functions and represent a technological benefit that generates real savings for the Mexican state in turn, institutions may collaborate with projects and initiatives for the development of open source software in accordance to Mexican regulations on the matter. Beautiful, isn't it? So it doesn't only allow you to use it, but it allows you to collaborate with you guys. This is kind of like the antithesis of everything else that we've heard. So this is pretty cool, pretty amazing. I have to say that there were a couple of discussions in regard of how this was going to be written. And when we saw it on paper, it was really nice. Then we have the general law on humanity, sciences, and technology that was actually approved this year. This also meant a lot of meetings with, um, with the um, with the different agencies that go through the process of authorization and if we look at article 11 of this law the consolidation of digital government and citizenship through the development and implementation of information technologies in particular open source software aimed at the continuous improvement of public services as well as compliance with principles of austerity efficiency effectiveness economy transparency and honesty so of course when you're talking about austerity I think there's nothing more aligned to it than having open software, and especially because we can benefit a lot from it. Article 81, and this is something that is really important to us and has really changed the way that Infotech looks in the, in the agenda um, nationally, is that public centers are fundamental institutions for achieving and consolidating the country scientific and technological independence. They will provide the Mexican government with scientific knowledge and its technological applications for the comprehensive attention of the national problems. So if we have a country that has quite a big technological debt to its population, that's why Infotech becomes an important partner of this solution and we need to, must be involved in the attention of these national issues. Then we go to another one, and see, they just keep on popping up. This is the Federal Republican Austerity Law. This is from 2019, Article 16. Procurement and leasing of computer equipment and systems will be carried out only in justified scenarios based on modernization plans and the priority use of open source software, provided that it meets the requirements for the exercise of public functions. So this is another law that takes us back to open source. And then the final one, although it doesn't have to do with open software, I thought it was important to, to show it to you guys. It's the general law for the protection of personal data and possession of ob obligated parties. We have a lot of issues sometimes with having actually the, the computing capacities within the government agencies. As you guys know, um, cloud is always a great possibility but there's always a very big resistance to the use of cloud, especially within government when they say that it's personal data 
when we look at our regulation, the only restriction that we have of taking information outside to the cloud is actually any information that's national security needs to be hosted within the government offices. Everything else can be going outside. But this law actually says in Article 63, the responsible party may contract or adhere to services, applications, and infrastructure in cloud computing. So when it comes to personal data, we are allowed by our law to host that information in the cloud. So this is just something that I wanted to put out there because it also gives you a view of how progressive maybe Mexico has been in regards to cloud computing and, and open source legislation. This law is from 2017, so this has been going on for quite a while now. About MIFOS, you're probably going to be thinking now, OK, so these guys are doing stuff, and why are they working with MIFOS? MIFOS was pretty much one conversation that I had with the, the, the coordinator of national strategy, where he said, somebody spoke about MIFOS. Can you research into it? And the day that I went onto their web page, and I discovered that they were an NGO, and that they were really working towards the democratization of banks and elimination of poverty, I pretty much said to myself, this is going to be the perfect match. The Mexican government, we want to include more people into the banking system. We're actually trying to, to move forward the country. We want to bankerize a whole lot of people. And we have a lot of, um, of banks in Mexico, so national banks, and we used to spend a lot of money. So when we were able to create this alliance and start working with, with MIFOS and the FINER Act, it really was a good way forward. And pretty much it was a very big um, ideology match that we were really looking for financial inclusion and being leaders within it. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what the two projects that we've done because of confidentiality, I cannot share any information of what banks we did. So everything is going to be very broad, but this is just for confidentiality purposes of, of our customers and, and the other government agencies. You're happy to ask more information. I'm not sure I'll be able to answer that. Um, why open banking for Mexican government? Yeah, we've got the legislation. We're allowed to do it, but it's a big effort to take away a private system, a legacy system, and actually come up with an open banking one. The truth is, one is the ideology, the second is the financial. When you think that Mexico currently has eight national development banks, and all of them are operating with mainframes, all of them are paying for licensing of their banking course. A lot of them are paying for additional licensing for third party platforms. And then they have to pay the maintenance. And if they have it on site, they have to pay for the power. It just becomes ridiculous. This is one of the scenarios that we looked at. So this agency in Mexico pretty much was spending in 2017 $22 million to operate just their banking core, nothing else. Like this is just literally their banking operations. It's nothing, it's not the payroll, it's not the additional software, it's not the computer licensing, it's just the core. In 2018, it went up to 32 million. In 2019, it went down a little bit to 30 million. And then finally, when we decided to start changing things around, it was in 28 million. So why keep on spending this money year over year for something that is not yours? Why do we keep on leasing a big mainframe when we don't really need it and we can operate in more economic infrastructure? So it was pretty much a no-brainer. If we multiply this by eight banks, it is a lot of money that could be going towards medical research. It could be going towards education, building more hospitals, just really developing the country. So that's where CB is conceived. It's literally the, the main idea behind it was to contribute to the financial inclusion in Mexico. There were very big efforts to start giving subsidies through national banks. So instead of going through third party banks, we could just do it directly and then that money would spend longer time with us. We wanted to have something that was gonna be scalable. So 
even though we had one case at that time, we wanted something that we could use in other situations, having in mind that we do have an, uh, eight banks to go around. And we wanted to make everything to be containerized and microservices, so that could give us a better future. Um, so this is kind of like a rundown of what the product is. So we've got our banking, um, and that's your usual, where you would have your customer, your savings, all these kind of things. Then you have a transactional switch where we're actually connecting to cards and all these um, um, authorizing. We have that traditional banking, so we can connect to ATMs, have checks, we can have um, actual windows where people can go and, and do services, merchant service, digital banking. Everything was happening during the pandemic, so one of the priorities was that people could access loans online, they could actually have a, a, an app, they could have a web portal to, to do all their banking through. We had to connect to regulators, so we pretty much had to connect to, of course, your credit bureau to be able to issue loans, but then we also had to go to the National Registry of Mexico, so we actually knew that the identities of the people were legitimate and that the name of the person was the name of the person that was registered. We also had to go to the tax agency in order to be able to see those those companies that were registering their accounts if they existed. And then we also connected to the National Electrical, Electoral Institute as a secondary proof of identity. And the proof of identity there can just be the ID, making sure that it's valid, but it can also be with biometric um, data where you're actually crossing it against that electoral role. Um, of course, all of it has a, a big um, security scheme, but of course, Victor can tell you a little bit more about, more about that. We have currently two scenarios of, of this technology um, that have been that have gone live within Mexico. We're hoping to get a third one before the end of the year, and, and that should be going live next year. So in the first scenario, it was um, both of them are quite big deployments. So the first one was 1,700 branches around the country. We imported 2.7 million historic records for debt recovery. So this is a lot of data, and this is just pretty much having the information to know what people owe the bank and how are you going to collect this. We have more than 10 million repayment transactions happening and registered, and we had a loan, um, loan uh, request that came out and we received 58,000 loan applications within five days. So this is pretty big um, for, I think, for any country. Um, and it was pretty good to, to be able to see that the technology could actually withstand it and that it was a success. In the second scenario, we have 2,000 branches operating countrywide. You need to remember Mexico is a very big country. We have 10, 20 million users of the platform up to 4 million car transactions happening, um, up to 5,000 interbank transactions per second, and that was what we were testing, um, and that was kind of like our stress test for, for the platform. And we had 150,000 loan applications filed within one week when we did the first campaign for the platform. So you can see the metrics, it's pretty good technology. And when you think about it, the benefit is a lot further and we will be able to keep on growing. This technology is not just a black box that we will have there and we won't be able to access anytime. So that's pretty much my part of the presentation. Now I'll hand it over to, to Victor to talk about more of the technical features and show you some images of the technology. Hope you like it. Hello, everyone. Um, I am the solution architect for Infotech. We are helping and collaborating with the federal uh, agency in order to enable the, the technology that we have been talking in the previous days and today, in this case, is Apache Finerac, in order to transform this in social benefits. Which are these social benefits? to promote the financial inclusion and to democratize the access to the financial services. Uh, this is a very quick sample about how we have done the deployment for the FINERAC. In this case, we have the, the core banking. 
we have built uh, ch digital channels around uh, this solution in order to uh, enable and to make easier to the general population to have access to this financial service. Our main focus has been the mobile application, which has been de de deployed to Android and iOS, which are the most common uh, mobile platforms. But also we have used another open source technologies like the field officer application in order to enroll new customers into the core banking. Uh, we have used uh, several, uh, another several open source project like the uh, web app, which is part of the MIFOS community in order to uh, improve and to align to the local regulations. Uh, in order to generate reports to uh, align also the loan products to the National Commission for, for Banking and Securities, to align also the reports for the central bank, which all the transactions must be encrypted and decrypted using either uh, certificates or, and, and, keys, and keys. And also we use hardware uh, like HSCN, which are required for for this, doing this kind of computing. Also, um, we have uh, the back office uh, users, which are in charge for designing this, this kind of product, which are savings, which are loans, or which are sharing accounts, which can be opened in any point of Mexico. As uh, Federico has uh, commented before, you can open, or the Mexican population can open an account anytime at any point of Mexico. Um, also, we have the web banking and internet banking that most accomplish, uh, I can say, most of the uh, most complicated regulation in the world because we have several layers of not only security but also in process. And and also we have to handle the, the load. How we handle the load, we have selected a database, which is ITANDB. Uh, this is a distributed database that help us to, um, to load the, the workload uh, in order to, to have a good performance with this amount of transaction happening in, in the core system. And also, we require to do this because there are uh, pension fund dis disbursement uh, that are happening most of the time every 15 days for the elders in order to, to promote also the, the, the wellness for this uh, population layer. So we have this challenge to this, this, this kind of bulk operation in, in the core banking. And also we have to integrate to accounting or to external system, which was another challenge. For example, to connect to, to the car management system, to the fraud management system also. And to connect to the ATMs because um, I can say that the, the, the government was decided to use debit cards to use the branches. So then this was a, a kind of a, of a challenge to, in order to connect solutions that were in mainframe, that were in another, I can say, closed solution. And most of the time we have to do some kind of reverse engineering in order to accomplish this kind of transaction. At the end, we have to uh, use a large team in order to accomplish these goals. It was almost 80 people working at the same time in different tracks, in mobile application, in core banking, improvement, um, to create the reports, to apply in testing, security testing, workload testing. And also, uh, we can say that the capacity of the Infotech has increased about the culture of open source software, how to do it in the Apache way. And I have to mention that this solution has been done using Finerac CN, which is another uh, open source project that is under the Apache umbrella. And we have also the challenge because we were reached by the pandemic at the middle of the execution of the project to, uh, to give loans to the population. So then we have used Finerac OneDorex, it's a, a platform that is more robust for, for loans. 
So we have enabled this uh, functionality in almost three months in order to, to provide this kind of loan for economic uh, let's say, um, reactivation for, for promoting, again, the, the com economic after the COVID-19. We are going to share some screen of our mobile application, which was one channel for making these financial services um, easier to, to be consumed by the population. We have linked the, the debit cards. They are, they are MasterCard uh, cards. Um, so then the, the people can check the balance that has in their accounts. Um, at the bottom, you can find Kodi. Kodi is a real-time payment system in Mexico that use QR in order for, to do payments person to per person or merchant to persons. Also, we have uh, the, the way to transfer money uh, doing uh, an SPAY. An SPAY is another real-time payment system. And also to, to check the, the transaction that has been happening in the, the previous uh, days or months. The people also can create a, a, an account, a level one account, uh, enrolling by, by themselves. They register the, the information about the, the customer. This information is checked uh, in a know your customer process with the national database uh, in order to, to validate the information. Also, we have some kind of biometrics. The, the person can take a selfie. The selfie detects the, 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 the face of the person. Check for uh, features in order to identify if this is not a fake uh, person or a picture, for example, and compare the, the information with the uh, blacklist in order to do the, the screening also. This is happening in real time. <clears throat> the, the person, uh, the, the, the C, CURP is the national population ID that all the Mexican has. Uh, and this is something to use for the status of the person, just to check this. This is not a dead person that happens, for example, uh, at, at least in the government programs. We check that the person is alive, that it has a valid status. And also, we use the email in order to do the enrollment. <clears throat> this is for, uh, for transfer. This is money transfer between the same accounts or interbank accounts. We have integrated also one-time password, OTPs, in order to confirm the, the transaction. So this is uh, another open source project that we have used, uh, Keycloak, for this solution, integrated to Finerac. And also, we, we receive the, the, the receipt or the status of the transaction, which, which, which can be checked in the central bank also, that the transaction has been executed. This is very important because we have to accomplish the functionality for having the name of mobile banking. Uh, this is not only a mobile banking because I want to name it. This must be certified by the central bank. The functionality that is um, provided by the mobile application. Uh, in this case, we are doing a transfer between uh, different banks, for example, between BBA to Santander or to Scotia Bank. We, we use the Clave account number, which is an interbank ID. We have also created another functionality for doing withdrawals in the merchants. For example, you can go to any convenience store, you can go to the supermarket and, and do the withdrawal. You only create this QR code, present to the um, cashier, uh, and, and you can do the withdrawal of the money that you have uh, previously set in the, in, the, in the transaction. Also, you can share this QR code with, with a family, with a friend, with the screen capture, and you can do the withdrawal with this, this code. This is a, a barcode. <clears throat> also, this uh, barcode can be canceled at any time if you don't want to, to do the transfer anymore. 
uh, or, or also, as I have mentioned, you can share with your friends, with your family, for helping them to do the, the, the withdrawal of, of the, the money, of the cash. <clears throat> also, there are some kind of self-service functionality for changing the, the password, for changing the phone number, for changing the email. Uh, the email is very important because this is the way that the people receive the notification. As we have mentioned, Mexico is a, a white country. Uh, there is a lack of access to the financial services. Part of the project was to first to enable the internet access and then to, to roll, out, roll out the financial services through mobile applications. And also to, to locate which are the nearest uh, branch and ATM to your lo location. This is important because during this federal administration, new branches were built in all the, the Mexican states. So it is important to find which is the, the closest branch to your location. So then this, and also this is required by the central bank in order to find which is the, the good one for you. So well, this is time for question and answer. If, if you have any technical query, please feel free to to raise them, and we are happy to, to help you. How is your comparison between CNN and the company? What are the good or bad implications of your company? I think that the community, well, Uh, could you please repeat it? Ah, I mean, okay, yeah, yeah. Which is the, 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 the best version for the community, Fineral CN or Fineral Wanderex? Yeah. The, um, I think that the community should go first for the Wanderex. Why? Because it is easier to deploy, easier to, to provide the functionality that I think most of the community is looking for, to give loans in a quick way to have an um, easy platform to maintain, and that is more adopted and tested for, for loans. Only if you have a huge team like the like Infotech team, you can enable new features on Fineraxian. You can test the, the functionality that will be created, because I can say that it is a, a raw framework. Fineraxian is a raw framework that only if you have the knowledge how to, how to build it, how to deploy it, how to orchestrate the microservice that are in Finaxian, you can go in this way. Of course, this is a distributed, uh, I can say, platform. Even uh, it has, the, the only common that is between Wanderex is the name, Finerac, but the architecture is another concept. Final users? How many users do you have the benefit of time on your platform? How many users are on your platform right now? Right now? Yeah. I can say thousands. The whole, the whole country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, they are right now they are doing the, the loans in the in the branches. Ye yesterday we registered two thousand six hundred applications. Yes. Um, across 1,700 branches. Yes, and... It's an interesting question. 
like the questions in regards of Infotech acting as a company when there is a lot of competition in Mexico and other companies that could offer the services. Um, when it comes to public tenders, um, the, the legislation has, they call it Article 1st, and Article 1st of the procurement law states that you can contract other government entities without the need of doing a public tender. So in saying that, it's not like that straight up. You do have to do a market research, and that market research needs to show that the country is going to be getting the best conditions for the state or the, the procurement. So it not necessarily has to be cheaper, but it does have to be a very good offer. So when it comes to those kind of contracts, we do we do get them through being competitive with the, with the rest of the of the competition. Um, we get some of our business that way. We also get some of our business through public tenders. So we actually go in and we put bids in. Um, it's complicated because then the process becomes a little bit lengthier and you actually have to have a team that's specialized on that. But then we also do a lot of through collaboration agreements. And those collaboration agreements state that there needs to be some money transferred to support the project. So that's how we do kind of like the three ways that we, that we work. Of course, private companies have been, I don't want to say an issue, but there was a lot of private interests in a lot of the government contracts. And of course, that has been an, an issue because when you're talking about a country that, that has um, a long history of corruption, when you come in as a private um, government agency, a public agency to take that contract, you're not in conditions to bribe government officials because we are government officials. And this has been one of the ideas behind the growth of Infotech to reduce corruption. So when people have private personal interests in some contracts, then the way to get that contract becomes a little bit more complicated. But that's been part of the idea behind it, that being government to government, we can reduce that, um, that situation in the country. Any other questions? Did we migrate from a legacy system? Um, in one of the scenarios, we migrated the data from a legacy system, and that was a bit of a nightmare, um, like any migration. In the second scenario, it was a little bit complicated because there wasn't a real system, but they had already started issuing loans by hand. So we had a whole lot of Excels, and that was probably worse than the, the other one, because at least the other one was a little bit more organized in tables. Um, we pretty much just looked at the way that we could restructure the data and insert it into the system and restructured. The biggest issue was that a lot of the information that we needed for the new platform, it didn't exist in the previous one. So there was a lot of decision making, a lot of going back to the, to the, to the agencies and telling them, hey, the platform needs this data, we haven't got it, what are we gonna do? And started to do those compromises of what we're actually going to include, what we're gonna drop. If they did have the data, how we were going to insert that. And, and in, the, in the first scenario, we, we also had to do a lot of um, data cleanup because everything was really, really, really messy. We even had, we had bank accounts that didn't have a name. So those kind of decisions you need to come together and say, like, how are we going to tackle this? Do we just send that to like a general bank account and kill the account? Or do you need to keep it? What is the procedure? Because it's also you're talking about banks, so it's not like they can just delete an account and, and that'll be it. So there was a lot of work and a lot of talking to the customer. Any other questions? Alex again. <laughs> 